preparing the live stream. So then I'll have to just check our Facebook to make sure that it's playing. All right. And we are officially live. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Griffith with Emerging Revolutionary War. I want to welcome you back to our latest installment of our Rev War Revelry. Tonight, we have a very uh, special presentation being given to our viewers by historian Glenn Williams. So, Glenn, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And for those of you not familiar with Glenn, he served on active duty as an infantry officer in the U.S. Army from 1975 to 1996. After military retirement, he entered public history as a second career and after stints in, at several private nonprofit museums and historic sites, he entered federal service in 2001 as historian of the American Battlefield Protection Program of the U.S. National Park Service uh, before uh, becoming a senior historian with the U.S. Army Center of Military History from 2004 until retirement in 2022. His specialty is 18th century military history, with a focus on the War of American Independence. Uh, his non-Center of Military History publications include Year of the Hangman, George Washington's Campaign Against the Iroquois, and the uh, book, which you can see floating next to him on his <laughs> screen, uh, Dunmore's War, The Last Conflict of America's Colonial Era. And he also contributed to the 10 Key Campaigns of the American Revolution, which was published in 2020 uh, with an article on Let It Begin Here, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. He continues to research, write, lecture, and lead tours as a historian in private practice now in his third career. He earned his PhD in history from the University of Maryland. So Glenn, I want to once again, thank you for being here tonight. And for our viewers, if you have any questions for him as we proceed, please do not hesitate to put them up in the chat and I will feed them to him. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome you all as Glenn presents for Britannia's Glory and Wealth. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Billy. And uh, let's start with the slides. All right. Okay. If if there ever was a, a discussion or talk to be on a, a a site about the emerging Revolutionary War era, is probably this one. The, the title of uh, my uh, my talk for Britannia's glory and wealth. And, and as we go along in the the talk, uh, you'll see where that came from. And um, let's dive right in. <laughs> go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, there's, it, uh, many of you have probably heard the song. It was uh, written by John Dickinson during the uh, Townsend uh, Duties Crisis, uh, 1768. It appeared in the uh, several colonial newspapers, including the Virginia Gazette. Uh, it was. It's called the Liberty Song, or it's called by many people the Liberty Song, and it's put to the tune of the British Royal Navy's uh, anthem uh, of the heart of oak. Uh, so you, you can get an idea of the flavor. I'm not going to sing it here. You know, I, I joined the Latin Scola at my parish. They said your Latin is fine, but you can't carry a tune in a bucket. So they fired me. Um, but you can see the, the, the one of the um, uh, the lines from the song, this bumper I crowned from his, for his sovereign's health and this for Britannia's glory and wealth. The wealth and glory immortal may be if she is just and we are but free. Okay. I, I like to emphasize, as you all probably know, but a lot of people that I talk to in some groups um, don't realize that um, uh, this, this is not a song about rebellion or revolution. Um, this is still when American colonists, for the most part, uh, looked on themselves as proud subjects of the king and proud to be members of the uh, uh, of uh, the British uh, Empire uh, and consider themselves British subjects by extension, even though they lived on this side of the Atlantic. So Billy, turn the slide over. First, let's uh, look at a few things. Uh, the, the British 
the, the, the British Constitution, yes, it's not a written constitution, but it's usually described as monarchy, ar aristocracy, and democracy, or the kings, lords, temporal, and spiritual, and the commons. Uh, and this was the, the constitution of the British government. Of course, the king is the monarch, parliament divided into an upper and lower house. Um, the colonial governments in, in the American colonies mirrored this constitution in the same way, uh, whether they were royal colonies or proprietary colonies, and even the uh, corporate colony of Connecticut, uh, except with one or two exceptions for the 13, uh, the, the colonial governments mirrored that of Great Britain. If we take Virginia, for example, um, the, the king's viceroy, the royal governor, um, sat in the place of the king, uh, and the uh, the upper house uh, of the General Assembly or the Colonial Assembly, um, the, the Colonial Council sat in the place of the Lord's Temporal and Spiritual. Uh, and the um, House of Burgesses, the elected lower house, stood in the place of the commons. And like the, the, the Parliament, all revenue bills, all taxation bills, any bills that had to do with spending had to originate in that lower house of the House of Burgesses in Virginia, the House of Commons in England, even today in our own government, they all have to originate in the lower house, uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, and and the, the basic uh, policy uh, for governing the, um, for the governing the colonies uh, is the, the, the uh, uh, economic system known as mercantilism, where the colonies existed to promote the wealth of mother country and the empire at large and re reflect basically uh, an economic arrangement as well as a military alliance between Great Britain and the colonies. A and this served us well uh, until the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War. Um, the French and Indian War being, of course, the North American theater of that conflict. But let's dive a little further. Oh, before we split, uh, you see across the bottom, I have four pictures of uh, colonial governmental houses. Of course, you probably recognize uh, the one uh, in the second last row as the Pennsylvania State House, uh, where the uh, Colonial Assembly of Pennsylvania met. On the left, that is uh, Colony House, if you don't recognize it. That, uh, that is the um, center of government for the colony of uh, Rhode Island. Uh, the one in the center is a graphic representation, since that building no longer exists, of, uh, of the Capitol in Williamsburg. The one that's there now dates from an earlier period. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the one on the top <laughs> was, is Boston, uh, the old state house. So the lower right is the state house in Philadelphia. So not, now you can advance it to the next slide. Uh, for years, the basic policy of Great Britain in relation to the 13 colonies in America was something called salutary no neglect. Basically, this meant that the, um, the, the separate colonies were allowed a degree of aut uh, um, autonomy, uh, provided they remained loyal, they pr produce uh, an economic uh, advantage to the mother country, and uh, uh, other than that, uh, the Great Britain's central government was just as happy to leave them alone to govern themselves, uh, with very few exceptions, one of the exceptions being the Navigation Acts, Navigation Acts having to do with the conduct of trade. And this is where the system of mercantilism comes in. Uh, the colonies produced raw materials, which they sent to uh, Great Britain in British flag vessels, British flag vessels also being of American ownership as well as British ownership, uh, where these raw materials were turned into manufactured goods. Uh, manufacturing was very, very, very limited in the colonies. Most of it had to be done uh, in Great Britain. So they would turn these um, uh, raw materials into finished goods where they were shipped all over the world and some of which came back to the, the 13 colonies, a very protected market, a uh, very lucrative protected market uh, for British commerce. And this helped to build Britannia's glory and wealth. Uh, 
following the Seven Years' War, there were some acts that were passed by Parliament and signed into law uh, that um, started to erode uh, the relationship between the colonies and, uh, and the, the mother country. Uh, one, of course, being the Proclamation of 1763. Um, if you're not familiar that everybody knows you know about the proclamation line where the arbitrary line drawn uh, along the appellations between the headwaters of the waters that flowed to the mississippi uh, were reserved to the several nations of indians uh, as their hunting ground uh, uh, what <laughs> what people don't, don't usually notice is the next line in in the proclamation said until our further pleasure is known which signaled to most of the American colonies that this was a temporary arrangement only. Um, there was also some other provisions in, in the uh, proclamation of 1763. One, it established four new provinces, uh, East and West Florida, formerly belonging to Spain, uh, ceded to Great Britain uh, after the Seven Years' War, um, Grenada in, in, the, in the West Indies. Uh, and let's see, what was the fourth one? Oh, yes, uh, Quebec. Uh, when you think Quebec, don't think of... Canada like we know it today. Uh, it was basically the, uh, um, the, the Canadian province of Quebec, plus what is now the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, uh, and uh, um, some of the others like into the areas of uh, Wisconsin and Iowa as well. Um, so that was also one of the provisions uh, of the uh, proclamation of 1763. Another is going back to westward expansion that any further Indian sessions of land had to be uh, executed by, uh, by treaty, uh, presided over by a, an officer of the crown, uh, and there were to be no more private purchases of Indian land uh, by individuals in, in the colonies. And um, that was how it was supposed to uh, proceed from there on. Um, the Sugar Act of 1764 was one of the navigation acts. Um, this was to uh, enforce mercantilism because a lot of American importers, particularly in New England, uh, were getting sugar and molasses from the West Indies, um, some coming from Dutch or French or Spanish possessions in the islands and some from other English colonies as well. Uh, and the Sugar Act was to uh, uh, was a means to cut down on the smuggling of, of, uh, of these materials from the non-British colonies into New England um, by reducing the taxes, but increasing the enforcement of the taxes, even though there were less. Um, the, the, the Sugar Act in effect was a way for Massachusetts and some of the other colonies to um, uh, to get hard currency because um, you know there, you always hear about well the British looked at the American colonies as being so rich and everything well they were land rich but cash poor and one of the ways that the, the colonies could get hard currency uh, was from uh, um, from the British I mean excuse me the French uh, Spanish and, and Dutch colonies in the West Indies um, the Sugar Act also required that uh, normally when these imports were sent to uh, the, the colonies most imports had to first be landed in Great Britain where they were taxed and then shipped to the colonies well the Previous to the Sugar Act, they were allowed to ship directly, uh, and this was an attempt, the Sugar Act was, um, to favor the British colonies in the West Indies and the shipment of their sugar. And that's why the Massachusetts folks didn't like it, because that, that did raise the price of sugar that they paid for from, from those other colonies. Now, the Quartering Act, we, we've heard of that before, too. Um, Quartering Act is where colonial governments had to provide quarters uh, for British troops stationed in America, uh, and not just quarters, not just places. Uh, usually they're vacant public buildings, or sometimes they were quartered with families or in public houses or some other kind of, of structure. Mm -hmm. And the colonial government also had to provide things like candles and straw for beds and things like this. Well, New York really railed against this because where were most of the British troops in North America stationed? They were stationed in New York, unless they were in frontier garrisons. Uh, and and it's, there was some 
discrepancy, but finally the British government relented on that somewhat, and it did not fall as far as hard on, on the, the New York colony uh, as it originally appeared it would. Uh, but this was also one of the, the things that the American colonists were starting to um, protest against. Uh, besides the Navigation Acts, um, the ending of the French and Indian War, we, a lot of times you'll hear, well, they had to pay down the war debt. Well, that's not why they looked, that's not why Parliament looked at the colonies, not to pay down the debt on the war, but to spread out the outlays of expenses for administering the governments and the colonies, and also the creation of a an American establishment of the British Army. Um, you, you all are probably familiar that the British Army had two main garrison places in, in the old country, uh, Great Britain uh, and, and Ireland. And Ireland probably had more troops stationed there than in Great Britain. Why? Because of the British tradition especially English tradition of not liking to have standing armies in peacetime. And the American colonists kind of uh, also were recipients of this tradition of not liking standing armies in peacetime. So therefore the garrisons in England are a lot smaller than the garrisons in Ireland. Why? Well, because the garrisons in England are paid for by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in Parliament, uh, the assistant to the, 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 the First Lord of the Treasury. In Ireland, those, uh, uh, that the money for the maintenance of the British Army in Ireland is paid for by the Irish Parliament by the Irish exchequer. Uh, so they are taxed more heavily uh, for doing that. And, and that's also where, since the bulk of the, the, the British army is there, um, it's also an army of occupation. Prior to 1755, Great Britain left the defense of the American colonies entirely to American militia and American provincial units. It's not until the French and Indian War starts that you see British regulars sent to North America. And this creation of this American establishment of the British Army is an extension of that to get the Americans pay for British troops stationed there. The Americans also not liking the maintenance of standing armies in peacetime also protest against that. So that's where we, we were left with that. So how are they going to raise the money? Okay, we've all heard of the Stamp Act. Um, the Stamp Act, of course, was a, a tax passed by Parliament uh, on paper, <laughs> playing dice, uh, dice, uh, playing cards, and a few other things. But the main point of the Stamp Act was they had, colonists had to conduct government or business affairs using stamped paper. It was the stamped paper that you purchased. And it was, it was the tax on the stamped paper that went to the treasury. And the treasury was to maintain, like I said, the British uh, Army's American establishment and British administration of the colonies. Now, why do the colonies not want to pay, pay this tax? Well, we mentioned before about the colonial governments mirror the British government. Um, all revenue ta acts have to start in the lower house of the assembly, uh, or just like the House of Commons. The American colonists saw the Stamp Act as an imposition by Parliament to raise what were called internal taxes on American colonists uh, to pay these fees. And that's why the, the Americans didn't like it. Uh, British subjects were proud of the fact that they could only be taxed, they could only be denied their own property, including money, uh, by their own free will or by their elected representatives. So they could only be taxed by their own uh, uh, consent. And they saw the Stamp, uh, Stamp Act as violating this principle. Uh, the protests were quick and, and uh, um, uh, immediately came with in the form of uh, non-importation, non-exportation agreements. Um, the Americans decided, well, if they want to play this game, we'll play this game. So ships full of cargoes bound for England with raw materials for British industry sat idle in the ports because the Americans would not use the stamp paper to do the bills of lading to load the ships. Um, same thing for 
ships coming from England with finished products for the American market cannot be unloaded because the, the, the agents uh, of the, the shippers in the colonies would not use the stamped paper uh, to do the bills of delivery. Um, so this, this kind of grinds everything to a halt. The Americans, uh, in a lot of cases, it, it, for legal purposes, would just ignore the Stamp Act for, for using stamp paper for conducting business and in, in court transactions. Um, so it very much uh, quickly went to the point that it was costing Great Britain to uh, more to enforce the Stamp Act than it was the revenue that it was receiving. Also with the imports from American uh, uh, raw materials going to England, uh, uh, drying up uh, because they would not ship. Um, there was soon unemployment in Great Britain. So the, the, the labor guilds or unions, we would call them today, um, started to sympathize with the Americans uh, because they weren't receiving the materials to, to go to work to, to transfer or to change these raw materials into manufactured goods. So they'd only lasted about a year before uh, England repeals the, the stamp um, Stamp Act, but what they do pass is the Declaratory Act, which tries to head off a, a future occurrence of the same thing by saying that Parliament uh, had the right um, to pass taxes for uh, regardless of where in the empire they were imposed, and that was meant directly to affect the Americans. The British try something else now. The Americans did not like the idea of the Stamp Act uh, being an internal tax to raise revenue. Um, they said uh, uh, import taxes were a different matter. Those were okay because you could either buy or not buy a, an imported product and therefore pay the taxes. And, and the tax would go to the administration of the colonies. So the British thought, well, with the Townsend duties, we'll only uh, put import duties on certain things, tea, uh, paint, lead, uh, glass, paper. Uh, so th they thought they, they had found a way around the Americans' uh, 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 objection to, to these. Uh, but the Americans said these are nothing more than internal taxes disguised as external taxes, because what were the revenues used for? The revenues were used to pay the salaries of royal officials in the colonies, such as the royal governors, um, the, the judges in certain courts, uh, and again, for the maintenance of the army. Um, so the, the Americans saw through that thinly veiled disguise of external taxes or import duties disguised as internal taxes. And, and if you look at it, you know, the, the general assemblies, the colonial assemblies, the only way they had of any kind of check and balance on the royal governors or proprietary governors was they controlled the colonial purse strings, just like the commons did in Great Britain. They were not going to give that up. So that's why the, 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 the opposition to the uh, Townsend duties. So, so when these are repealed in 1770, um, uh, they're replaced, uh, they're all repealed except for the, the Tea Act in 1770, except for the tax on tea, which is followed by the Tea Act in 1773. So let's go next slide. Uh, before we move on, we do have one question. Okay. And it comes from Bob Wong. He says, why did the Stamp Act and other acts not cause a similar revolt rejection by other colonies in the British Empire? Uh, because the, um, the, the, the American colonies had that special relationship with the mother country. They weren't conquered provinces, um, for one. Um, and that was a, a distinction the Americans were proud of. They were not colonies in the sense like Quebec is now, where it it's taken by the British in a war with France, and, and the, the the new province of Quebec comes into the British Empire as a conquered territory. So the Americans are very proud of the fact that the thirteen seaboard colonies are not those kind of colonies. Second, the Americans play into this too because they're saying, hey. Our 13 colonial governments have the same status in the empire as Ireland, a part of the British Empire, a part of the three United Kingdoms. Um, so that they, they maintained um, that they should also be represented, each of them, like Ireland, uh, having its own 
uh, assembly uh, and having its own, instead of a Lord Lieutenant, having its own royal or proprietary governor uh, to manage that. And that those laws, if Parliament needed so much money for the colonies to maintain government uh, uh, administration in the colonies, they should do it the same way that they do in Ireland, where the Irish Parliament passes the laws, which are then uh, passed both houses of the Irish Parliament, signed into law with the king's assent by the Lord Lieutenant, and taxed in Ireland for the maintenance of Irish administration. So the Americans were saying, hey, our 13 governments need to be able to do the same thing. I hope that answers the question. So let's talk a little more about the, the constitutional crisis. Um, in all of these crises, Virginia and Massachusetts seem to, to lead the, the way for resistance against anything the Crown wants to do. Uh, so um, they do hold a stamp back Congress, a first attempt to try to, to have some kind of unified action to plan resistance. Uh, it's attem attended by representatives from, from nine colonies. And in each of the crises, or at least in the first two, the uh, Stamp and, and Townsend uh, crises, uh, the, the method of resistance, the favored method of resistance is uh, associations that form for the non-importation and exportation uh, voluntarily uh, by, by Americans. And, and these are there's, you know, it's the Stamp Act, uh, uh, non-importation, non-exportation are, are agreements are a lot more effective than they would be in Townsend. But Townsend, to a degree, was um, still uh, uh, effective to to a degree, uh, where it did force uh, Parliament to uh, repeal um, the Stamp and, and Townsend duties uh, after after a, a measure of resistance. So next slide. As I mentioned before, we have the Declaratory Act on there. That was in, uh, Parliament's way of exerting its authority even over all the colonies. Um, we've already uh, covered some of these, the towns and uh, towns and duties, uh, an internal tax disguised as an external tax by taxing imports into uh, uh, the colonies, um, but the, the, the colonial resistance still maintained that this was taking away the power of the uh, elected uh, lower houses of assembly in having the right to uh, tax, to impose taxes by the consent of the governed. And that was the, the, the whole idea behind it. The Townsend duties are repealed in 1770. Um, I have the picture of the Boston Massacre there because they're repealed on the same day, March 5th, 1770, as, uh, as the uh, Boston Massacre occurs. And the Boston Massacre occurred uh, part of partly in resistance um, to the Townsend duties when the British government put, uh, put Boston under military occupation in its attempt to enforce the Townsend duties. Uh, so next slide. The term taxation without representation comes from the resistance to these two Acts the stamp uh, stamp uh, um, the stamped act as well as the Townsend duties, uh, and, and I, I I really like to quote these lines from the song the Liberty Song uh, because it is a protest song against the Townsend duties in particular. And notice how it how it reads: Our purses are ready, steady boys, steady. Not a slave, but as free men, our money will give. They're this is where the term taxation without representation affects the American colonies. Uh, I know some folks say, well, uh, they were against these taxes because um, they didn't have a representation in Parliament or they wanted representation in Parliament. Now, eh, wrong. Uh, the, probably the last thing the colonists wanted was representation in Parliament. They might have had 13 at the most, but probably less uh, uh, delegates from the colonies in, in the lower house of parliament, in the house of commons. Uh, and they would have been overwhelmed by anything that uh, the, the government party wanted to impose on the colonies. Instead, they say taxation without representation. By representation, we mean 
as freeborn Englishmen. Uh, we have the right to be taxed only by our own consent and those of our elected representatives, the lower houses of parliament. That's what it means. And if taxed that way, in the constitutional method, by the, by, according to the British Constitution, not as slaves, but as free men, our money will give. Slaves are defined as people that work for somebody else's benefit, not to keep the fruits of their own labor. So they're reflecting on this uh, in the Liberty Song. Next slide. Uh, many of you know, I wrote a book about uh, Dunmore's War. And uh, while I was doing the research, you know, I started to kind of like Lord Dunmore. And when he's in the House of Lords in Parliament in 1770, he's the one that makes a speech uh, and pushes the motion for repeal of the Townsend duties in the upper house, in the House of Lords. Um, and shortly thereafter, he's appointed the royal governor of New York. And when he gets to New York, after he's sworn into office, you know, he makes a speech. Um, we would call it probably the inaugural address. And, and he makes uh, the statement that, uh, that uh, the Constitution is fixed. He's referring to the British Constitution, where the, the lower house is where tax or revenue uh, revenue laws have to start and he's affirming the right to New York colonists that uh, this, the, the constitution is recognizing that taxes have to start in their lower house of assembly. I also like him because as part of his speech to, to the House of Lords to urge repeal the Townsend duties and to second the repeal of the Townsend duties, he says Americans have left to themselves would soon be quiet. And for a long time in some history books, uh, the period between the repeal of the uh, Townsend duties, or if you want to count it from the, the Boston massacre to the Boston Tea Party is sometimes referred to as the quiet time. Next slide. Now, during the first few years at uh, Dunmore, um, he was only royal governor in New York for about a year. But when he gets there, one of the first things that happens is that the, uh, um, the, the royal governor of Buenos Aires of a Spanish colony of Buenos Aires involved, invades, of all places, the Falkland Islands, uh, which were claimed by Great Britain. And Spain and Great Britain nearly go to war in, in this time. And uh, uh, it was during this period of quiet while, where the, uh, uh, the British are preparing to possibly have to fight another war against Spain, uh, probably involving their American colonies. Um, so that uh, there's a little interlude in this quiet time where the empire is united again against a possible outside uh, enemy. But again, the Tea Act is passed in 1773. Remember, the Townsend duties repealed all the duties except the one on tea. Now, why is tea going to be a problem? Uh, you know, it's, uh, because Americans didn't want to drink tea? No. Uh, because uh, the tax on tea was onerous? No. Americans were actually paying less for their tea uh, than people in England. Uh, but the Tea Act had several provisions that were not acceptable to the Americans. One, we all know that uh, the Tea Act was enacted partly to bail out um, the British East India Company, uh, a quasi-government organization, um, too big to fail. You, you've all heard these terms before in more recent times. Uh, so in, in an effort to um, bail out the East India Company, uh, instead of shipping their tea to England, where it would be taxed before it could be exported to the colonies, the East India Company was allowed to ship directly to the colonies where it would be taxed in the colonies instead of in England before being sent over. Also, the, the tax was fairly minimal. Um, however, the, the problem was the Tea Act granted the East India Company a virtual monopoly over the sale of tea in the colonies. Um, second, those taxes on the tea uh, could be raised at any time. They were not to be permanent. And third, and again, here, a repeat of the story of the Stamp Act and the Townsend duties, the revenues collected were, go, were to go to maintaining British administration of the colonies and the American establishment of the British Army. 
things that were more of benefit to Great Britain, but the colonies being forced to pay them as if they were theirs. Americans, again, not liking the maintenance of standing armies in peacetime. And also the, the loss of the check and balance by the lower houses of assembly controlling the purse strings of the colonial treasuries. Next slide. And we all know about the Boston Tea Party and what the, that caused. Uh, and and the, the British reaction, the British government's reaction is pretty heavy handed uh, with the uh, imposition of the coercive, uh, coercive acts. Uh, um, uh, and you'll see them there. The Boston Port Act, which was the first one to go into effect in, in June of 1774, virtually closed the port of Boston to imports and exports. Uh, and, and also with some of the other uh, uh, port cities in, in uh, Massachusetts suffering as well. And the American, other American colonies decided to help their neighboring uh, uh, their sister colony by shipping some of those things that were no longer being unloaded in, in Boston. Along with the Boston Port Act, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the city is now pretty much under, uh, well, the whole colony is supposed to be under military occupation, but basically it's the, the city of Boston. That's followed a little bit later in the summer by the Massachusetts Government Act. I think this is the most onerous of the, of the uh, uh, intolerable acts um, where General Gage, the commander in chief of His Majesty's forces in North America, also becomes the royal governor uh, of Massachusetts. Um, it also does several other things. It, it, it suspends the uh, uh, um, the the. the New England or the Massachusetts system of town meetings are only allowed to meet a certain amount of time. Uh, it, it negates the way the, uh, the, 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 the colonial government in Massachusetts elected its upper house. In most colonies, the upper house was appointed by the crown. And that's why it mirrors the, the House of Lords. In Massachusetts, um, the House of Representatives, the lower house, were the ones that elected the, the, the members of the Colonial Council, the upper house. Well, the, the Massachusetts Government Act does away with this. Uh, and it virtually puts the, uh, the whole colony under uh, martial law and abrogates uh, uh, the royal charter of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, the Impartial Administration of Justice Act is another one of the intolerable acts. What did that do? Well, that said that in any legal dispute between uh, a, um, an American British subject and a British officer or other kind of official of the British government, um, the, the trial had to be held in England. Uh, what did that do? Well, you're supposed to be... Um, you're supposed to be tried by a jury of your peers. Well, if you live in Boston, your peers are not living in London. Uh, so this is why that's an intolerable act, uh, according to the Massachusetts people. Uh, and, and the last is the Quebec Act. Quebec Act. The Quebec Act um, establishes the province of Quebec um, as a new uh, a colony uh, in North America. I already, men already mentioned that it includes not only the present uh, province of Quebec in Canada, but also Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, and so forth. And also the government of Quebec was to be an appointed assembly, both lower and upper house. The American colonists looked at this and say, if they can do this to Massachusetts Bay, they can do it to any of us. And that's why the resistance uh, to, to British rule uh, that is in reaction to the imposition of the uh, coercive or intolerable acts. And in New England or in Massachusetts Bay, this is first... Uh, the first opposition to this uh, comes in the form of the Suffolk, Revol or Suffolk Resolves. Uh, then the, the, the Sons of Liberty and the members of the colonial assemblies establish a committee of correspondence. And there is a call to have a general congress uh, of delegates from the 13 colonies uh, to meet in Philadelphia. And this is what we know now as the first continental congress uh, 12 of the 13 colonies send delegates georgia is the only one that does not so next slide 
we have uh, another question. Oh. And it is, was the Impartial Administration of Justice Act enforced in British-controlled cities like Philadelphia, Charleston, and Savannah during the war? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this before. The first four, or one, two, th the first three of the Intolerable Acts, Coercive Acts, only apply to Massachusetts Bay. Only the Quebec Act uh, is, is not strictly Massachusetts Bay. And who does that affect mostly? Okay, what colony's charter gives that colony jurisdiction or first right of refusal in the session of Indian lands in what is now Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan? It's Virginia. Okay. And um, the, so the, four, the, 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 the Quebec Act mostly affects Virginia. Um, the other three only directly affected Massachusetts Bay, not the others. The other colonies looked at it and said, if they can do it to Massachusetts Bay, they can do it to us. Does that answer the question, I hope? I think so. Next slide. <laughs> when they convene the General Congress, um, which we now call the First Continental Congress. Its purpose was not revolution, not rebellion, but to obtain a redress of grievances. And that's why I have that in bold. Its main purpose was to get redress of these grievances that we've just talked about, the, the four coercive acts uh, against the uh, 13 colonies, which threatened the destruction of the lives, liberty, property of His Majesty's subjects in North America. Okay, that's what they were protesting. Next slide. So the, the Continental First Continental Congress was an idea to, to bring the delegates of the 13 colonies together for some kind of unified action. The result is the Continental Association. Some colonies had already started something like this. Virginia, for one, uh, started uh, a Virginia Association, but basically said the same thing that the other delegates are going to to sign resolve to sign on to. Uh, again, non-importation, non-exportation, and non-consumption agreements, voluntary agreements. Uh, it worked against the Stamp Act worked against the towns and duties, although maybe not as effectively. Uh, but uh, uh, this time it was supposed to be more rigid enforcement. Um, that's why the different um, uh, people that signed on to the Continental uh, uh, Association uh, formed local committees, county or city committees of observation and, and, uh, uh, and uh, um, observation and I forgot what the other one's called. It'll, be, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, it's, uh, to to enforce uh, these these agreements not to buy or sell any British goods or import or export any British goods. To protect the committees, um, the Continental uh, Association urged the colonies to form independent volunteer militia companies at the county level or the city level. Uh, notice independent. The independent means they are not subject to the authority of the royal or proprietary governors. Okay, they are not paid for by the taxes collected for those purposes. Um, they are paid for by the local committees who impose their own taxation system to help enforce uh, the Continental Association. Uh, and their job is to protect the committees. These volunteer companies are there to protect the, the committees against the interference by the militia that is under the control of the royal or proprietary governors. Um, so th that's the difference. That's uh, what's meant by the independent uh, volunteer militia companies. In Virginia, um, the, the, the northern counties formed six companies. Um, they asked George Washington to be their field officer um, and uh, you've all heard that George Washington attends the opening session of the Second Continental Congress wearing his militia uniform or his militia colonel's uniform. And a lot of times in a book, when you see that he's doing this, they show you the picture of him wearing his Virginia regiment uniform from the French and Indian War by, by Charles Wilson Peale. But that's not the uniform he wore. He developed a uniform for these independent militia companies in Northern Virginia to be blue faced with buff uh, 
with a buff waistcoat and, and, and buff uh, buff pants. And you'll see that is the uniform he wore to the Second Continental Congress. And when he accepts uh, command uh, of the Continental Army, it becomes the officer. Uh, it becomes the, the, the uniform uh, of the general officers and general staff of the Continental Army. Blue faced with buff. Next slide. Massachusetts, again, is leading the way on this, um, Massachusetts being under uh, martial law, although the, 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 the reach of General Gage's authority doesn't go much beyond the limits of the city of Boston. Uh, so the Massachusetts uh, uh, resistance gets together uh, and they form the Provincial Congress with its capital at Concord. Um, they start collecting their own taxes. They start telling the uh, the town uh, uh, the town meetings uh, that instead of sending the revenue they collect to Boston for use by the the royal treasury, they send it to Concord uh, for this shadow government they've called they formed called the Massachusetts Provincial Con Con Congress. And out of that, they form an executive committee called uh, the Committee of Safety uh, and a Committee of Supplies. So they start stockpiling military equipment and supplies, you know, not just guns and ammo, but tents and wagons and uh, uh, different things that we'll need to support an army uh, in case uh, there's a heavy-handed response by the British Army under General Gage from Boston uh, against the uh, Provincial Congress. They also reform the Massachusetts militia. Uh, the militia has two main bodies, the common militia, sometimes called the regular militia, which is every able-bodied white male uh, between the ages of 16 and 60. Um, uh, some of the officers that are in command of the Massachusetts militia, which is organized pretty much as a regional uh, force, uh, are have been appointed by crown officials before. But the, the, um, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress wants to start weeding them out with more reliable people of the Whig political uh, uh, leaning. Um, they also decide to form a select militia. Um, this will be made up of younger men, preferably bachelors, uh, and these will be the, the these will become the Minutemen, though they're part of the militia. One fourth of the militia uh, will be formed as these Minutemen, whereas the regular or common militia are basically tied to their counties unless they're called out by a higher authority. These Minutemen can deploy to any county uh, within within the province of Massachusetts Bay. Um, an interesting thing about uh, the, the Minutemen too uh, is whereas everybody is a member of the militia uh, in the common militia, but only one fourth of the uh, uh, the minute uh, one fourth of the militia are Minutemen. They train more often. They have to be more ready. They have to uh, be more proficient. So as a result, they train more often, sometimes four times a, a month. And in order to get uh, a laborer to miss a day's wages or a farmer to miss a, a day's work uh, in his fields, uh, the Minutemen are paid at the same per diem rate as British regulars. Uh, and where does this money come from? Well, the, the town the town meetings in the various towns uh, vote to tax themselves to raise the money uh, to pay for a military force, uh, the, 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 the Minutemen. Um, and that's why uh, when, when on the 19th of April, when the shooting starts, it, it's a company of common militia that faces the British on the Lexington Green, not Minutemen, because the town of Lexington did not vote to raise the money to pay for a company of Minutemen as well. Uh, all these forces, Minutemen and the common militia together, uh, are to be held in readiness to form an army of observation in the case that the, the, the British government and the representatives in Boston decide to use military force against the, the Provincial Congress and the people of Massachusetts. So that's why it's called an army of observation. They were, they were in readiness, but watching the developments of what the British government is going to do. So next slide. Uh, I, I like this slide because yeah, uh, I think John Adams says the American Revolution starts in 1765 with the, the Stamp Act and goes all the way to 1787 
uh, when the Constitution is adopted. Uh, however, I know it's used interchangeably, but like Benjamin Rush and other people were were uh, want to say that there's a difference between the American Revolution and the war for independence. And I think the best way it's summed up is Benjamin Rush's uh, address. Uh, there is nothing more common than to confound the terms American Revolution with those of the late American War. Um, so with that, I'll leave you. So next slide. <laughs> Unless there's any questions, this concludes my presentation. And I thank you and welcome any other questions you may have. I'm gonna make sure everybody sees the uh, yeah. book first. But uh, <laughs> now it looks like um, you answered all the questions that we did receive, at least during the presentation. And that's obviously not a bad thing. It meant that you uh, were very thorough and left little doubt. <laughs> Except my friend Bob Wong always finds a question to ask me. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you, Glenn, for. Um... Oh, oh, we did get a question in. Uh oh. <laughs> it's a slightly off topic question. It was, why was Andrew Lewis passed over for promotion in the Continental Army? <laughs> well, there might have been a couple reasons. Um, for those of you who don't know, Andrew Lewis um, was a colonel uh, of Virginia militia. He commanded uh, the um, southern or left wing of the army during Dunmore's War. He was in command at the Battle of Point Pleasant in, in October of 1774. Um, interestingly enough, he had served under Washington in the Virginia Regiment, uh, where he was, uh, I think he rose to the rank of major there. Um, he's one of the senior colonels in, in the Virginia militia at the time. He's also a member of the House of Burgesses. Um, I think he was passed over, one, because of his age, because by then he's in his 50s. Um, Second, uh, some people criticized his, his command of the Virginia forces at the Battle of Point Pleasant. Um, if we just look at what just happened in Israel, where there was a, an intelligence failure. Well, some people blamed Lewis for the Virginia army being surprised the way they were on the 10th of October and, and not being as ready as they could have been. Um, and, and lastly, um, the way the Congress established the Continental Army, um, there were only so many general officers that could be from each colony, soon to be state. Um, and I think uh, that had something to do with it, too. He would have been a, a, a third um, but he kind of gets his revenge. He's in command of Virginia forces that forces his former boss, Dunmore, <laughs> to, to evacuate Gwen's Island in, in June of 1776. Um, he does stay in the militia, uh, and um, I think he dies in 1781, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so he, he was not in very good health towards the, you know, the, the latter part of the war anyway. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, thank you, Glenn, for that uh, awesome presentation. Um, for those who are still with us uh, on the Zoom, uh, we want to let you know that uh, in less than two weeks, uh, we have our bus tour down in Charleston for the year. We are looking forward to seeing uh, many of you there for that. And then on November 12th, we will return for our next revelry, and that will be at 7 p.m. here on Facebook. It will be a book talk with the author of the new book, T. Consumption, Politics, and Revolution, 1773 <laughs> to 1776. So as we head into the 250th year, uh, very excited to be able to discuss all of these topics that led to eventual armed hostilities. Oh, good follow on to this talk. So. <laughs> so thank you again, Glenn, and uh, thank you, everybody else, for tuning in tonight. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>